Um, hello, I'm Stephanie. Thank you, Francesca, for the nice introduction. And maybe thank you uh, to the Latvian Center of Contemporary Art for inviting me today. I'm really happy and excited to be here. And also thanks for this uh, impeccable organization of everything. So, as Francesca already said, I'm going to talk uh, about an exhibition that I organized uh, at Lehnbach House actually in 2015. I think I indicated the wrong year for the, for the little publication, whatever. Um, so, uh, and this is an exhibition where there were several instances of reconstruction, but mainly reinterpretation for different uh, reasons. So much of the work was actually in extremely poor condition being stored in a parking garage uh, outside of Paris and in, um, owned by the sun and uh, works were broken, dirty, uh, had to be repaired, pieces were missing, uh, all sorts of conditions. And um, so also the artist, as you are going to see, had worked in several large environments and there of course nothing was left. So my uh, talk is actually going to focus more on a strategy of reinterpretation and I'm going to show you one large example and one tiny example of those processes of, um, of uh, reinterpretation. So this differs a little bit maybe from other um, uh, approaches. If you work more on like a discrete object that goes into a collection or an installation that um, is more confined as those sprawling environments, you would of course have uh, different approaches. So these are pretty loose. Uh, the structure of the talk, I'm going to rush through the main phases of Lublin's work, just so that you see why I was even considering of doing a reconstruction. I'm going to click through a few impressions of the exhibition at Lehmbach House, so that you can gauge the space. Then I'm going to focus on one environment, Fluvio Subtonal, that Lea Lublin did in 1969, from which, uh, which I reinterpreted for the exhibition. And uh, then I will not talk about um, the acquisition of a performative installation called Abstract Film Number no. 1 by Bali Export that I worked off at MoMA, actually with Glenn Wharton, who wrote, um, whose text you can read, uh, just because there is no time. I might, without saying anything, click through three images if, in case it becomes interesting during the discussion later. Okay, here we go. So, um, Lia Lublin, born in 1929 in Poland, emigrates to Argentina uh, at age two. And in 1965, she makes the object that you see here, um, which is her goodbye to painting. She had been a painter for uh, over 10 years at that point. And she uh, makes this object to say goodbye to um, also what she perceived as a very uh, like rigid and uh, non-active approach to uh, art perception, so she wanted to break up the, um, that uh, kind of static relationship between viewer and painting, which is why there was a little rubber ball on top of this painting and people were invited to attack the painting by squirting water on it, and then the painting in a way defended itself by wiping itself clean. So both the painting and the uh, participant were active. She moves on to work in very large scale um, in uh, Going back to Latin America, does big environments uh, in Argentina, one of which you see here, Terranautas, you see photos and a map, a plan, a sketch, and uh, also in Santiago de Chile. And she then, uh, going back to Paris, carries this sort of interactive approach into a more speech-based procedure by uh, doing sociological art projects where she asks people, both in art contexts, such as FIAC in 1975, but also on the street in Antwerp, in Germany, in different locations around Europe, questions about art. Is art desire? Is art this? Is art that? And um, we carried on this project actually in the exhibition by uh, having a group of students develop the questions from today and um, do a performance of this, but this is not the topic. Uh, there is a more decidedly feminist period in her work where she approaches, um, where she uses the same approach but, uh, and applies it to questions about women. We see here uh, a banner she made with questions, provocative questions about the statues of women, which is then after a procession through Paris drowned in the, in the Seine. The problem has not been drowned with, unfortunately. Um, and then she goes back to painting in the 80s and in a, makes a series of deconstructions of um, Renaissance paintings. Uh, which uh, uh, the, the, the series was called Le Zizi du Peintre, which means the painter's wee-wee, 
and it was about the ego of the painter and also uh, an art historical analysis of the suppression of the body in modernism. And then she does a whole series of uh, investigations into Marcel Duchamp's um, time in Buenos Aires in the early 20th century and what it meant for the genesis of his work. Okay, so um, you can see that there is a lot of different types of works with different degrees of interaction, interactivity, performativity, etc. And one could have done a good looking show, I think, with the objects that were uh, available, although we had to restore pretty much every single object that was in the exhibition. And you would have seen those types of works, big paintings, basically conceptual artists from a certain time, very interesting work, no doubt. However, the main uh, concern that Lublin had from 65 on was how to engage the viewer, how to make the viewer participant, how to experience art not only retinally and also not only intellectually. Uh, how can I, um, how, what does our bodily involvement in art do to us, do to our habitus uh, around an art institution? So I felt we couldn't just um, not, uh, not have this component of a work and it wouldn't have been true to the artist's intentions. There were several environments, as I said, that she did, all of which were sprawling, huge, hundreds of square meters inside and outside of institutions. Um, so the question was how, which one to actually use, and I chose to work with uh, Fluvio Subtonal, which was an environment of uh, roughly 900 square meters that Lublin installed in Santa Fe, Argentina in 1969 in an uh, empty department store. And this was kind of a high profile art project because it was commissioned by the state as um, an homage to one of the largest construction projects that was taking place in Argentina at the time, which was the Tunnel Subfluvial Hernanderías, which was a, a, a tunnel under a river. And she, of course, her, her title is a play on this Fluvio Subtunnel, Tunnel Subfluvial. So she made this. Um, journey, it was kind of, she called it a passage, so you had to walk through different phases, and it was her uh, yeah, homage to that, to that project, and as you'll see in a pretty uh, wacky way. So uh, on the, it was, um, <coughs> at least she had a concept paper where she lined out different zones, which of course the visitor could not really, or the participant couldn't know, it, they didn't know what they were called. But you had to, um, what was important to her were different, different sensual uh, experiences that you had to, should go through. Um, so this was structured around both natural and technological elements. So you see here, you had to go through a curtain. Uh, there were plastic shapes. I should also point while talking. Um, these plastic uh, shapes, then you had to go through a curtain with projections of workers constructing the actual tunnel and uh, there was a technological zone with a concrete mixer and these monitors which actually had a live transmission from another part of the environment. People had to struggle with objects, they could play with these inflatable figures. There was a shooting range and uh, this was also in reference to kind of the pop culture, pop popular culture things that were happening at the same time in the town. There was the Semana del Tunnel, a week of events uh, in homage of the tunnel, and there were all sorts of fairs everywhere. So she wanted that type of popular connotation also in her work. And then you would get to the Fluvio Subtunnel proper, which was, um, uh, as you see, an inflatable architecture that people were invited to walk through. There was a thin stream of water in there. There was a padding zoo and uh, a hangout space with a styrofoam. Um, you might see how it would not be uh, a good idea to reconstruct this, or even a feasible one. And this is actually a second iteration of this uh, work, one could say, under a different title, Penetración Expulsión in uh, Colombia. And she only showed the tunnel element and the hanging plastic shapes. And from there I decided, okay, there is a distinction between individual sculptural elements that she used again and then there's all the stuff that she kind of found on site that she uh, used because it was um, it was there and it was handy 
And uh, on the other hand, I didn't only want to install an object such as the tunnel. I kind of wanted to go with her desire for uh, perceptual uh, experience, for bodily experience. So I decided that this is the Kunstbau um, space at Lehmbach House, which has the dimensions and style of a subway platform. It's uh, actually above the actual subway and was built at the same time as the subway, so it's very long, uh, very skinny, and uh, has concrete columns in the middle. And this is where you enter, and then the environment started here and went all the way to here. And this is like 50 meters, or no, not quite, 40 meters. And um, I couldn't construct anything here because there are fire regulations. You only have two meters. <clears throat> so um, here it is important to say, my desire was not to um, reconstruct this work. I did not want to have the appearance of, I was not going to pretend that we're in Argentina in the late 60s and I'm in a, a department store, I can't have a petting zoo, etc. So this kind of endeavor is compromised from the beginning. And so I was intending to keep her desire of sensual, sensual um, stimulus and of uh, kind of an activation of the, of the viewer object environment um, um, uh, relationship. So you would walk through, you would enter here um, in these water basins. People could have walked through them, but of course they didn't. Um, and then you would go through these plastic shapes, which were constructed. I, I had a company, plastic company. Uh, we, we had exact sketches and dimensions um, by Lublin in her archives, so we could reconstruct those. You would walk through the image of um, workers, which Lublin did not have in her archive, but there's a company who constructed the tunnel, and um, they had um, those historical images on <coughs> file. And then you would walk through um, this, um, it, where am I here? Um, you would come out of the curtain, as you see here, and walk through these monitors, and they had a live feed from another part of the environment. You can maybe see this here, this is further on. Um, this is the tunnel structure, so people could see visitors in front of them, which was also Lublin's desire. There was a concrete mixer here, and we didn't have clay or concrete in them, of course, but um, a synthetic material, which was, that was a big issue. Um, it was uh, called clay corn. We wanted something else. It was damaged by temperature change during transport. It didn't work. So in the end, we needed something that doesn't make a big mess, but I still kind of, what people want to touch it. So it was this clay corn, and people were just like constructing stuff out of it and sticking it on the, on the wall, uh, which I don't have documentation of. And then it would actually, let me go back, you would go into this space, which was a black light space that Lublin also had, and it had local produce. So of course Lublin had um, Argentinian produce, and I decided to have Munich produce. So we had spices in there, apples, beer, and there was a scent which was important. You could smell um, something, well, organic. And then you would come out, go through these rubber bands, and then uh, arrive at the shooting booth, which of course also looks entirely different. And which was also the intention. I didn't seek to then make it look um, the same. What was important, and this surprised me, it really worked. People used this thing. And however, you need, of course, guards, um, personnel, who helps with this. People will not just pick up the Nerf gun and do it and, and might get stuck and so on. So this was a challenge because our guards are not used to this kind of uh, work and we had many discussions about it. And then you would arrive at the um, Fluvio proper, and there I was, I have to say, pretty proud. Uh, there was only one image of the tunnel entrance of uh, Lublin's, without which I could have never done the reconstruction, I mean the reinterpretation, although this is rather reconstruction. And she wanted it to have sexual connotations, because these <laughs> were the lips, and then you go into a phallic structure. And the whole thing is maintained by a very strong fan. And so coming out of the structure, you're kind of like pushed out by this wind, and it's like a birth canal. <laughs> so um, it was incredibly complicated. I, I have two more minutes. I know I'm a little over. Um, it was very complicated to find someone who could walk in these colors. Uh, everybody could work in transparent material, but the color material is not uh, fireproof. It doesn't, um, it doesn't work with the fire regulations. 
and I only found one company who had an idea of constructing this whole thing without color and then putting a foil on it in color, which then made it uh, okay for the regulations. Um, Stephanie, you have five minutes more. I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> five exact minutes ah, from now. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so you have uh, impressions here of, um, of, uh, yeah, of some of the, the visitors engaging with this. This works very well when there's a group of people. I mean, I don't know for people in Latvia, but Germans, it's not just a cliche that they're reserved. They are reserved. So it's, it's difficult to get them to take their shoes off, go into the birth canal and seem silly. And some love it, some don't. And as soon as you have more than two people, it works great. If you have one visitor, not so great. And um, then there were little technical issues which I thought that were kind of consistent with, with Lublin's problems. When you open the chamber and you go in, there's of course the air pressure goes down. And if a lot of people would go in and out, the whole thing would slowly go down. People had to like get smaller and smaller, but then it slowly builds up again. And what was interesting, Lublin and her concept papers kept on writing about the importance of inside and outside, the perception in and out, which of course had to do with it being about a tunnel as well, and her making an absurd, inverted tunnel. But once I went into the structure, uh, I, I, I really got it, because your whole um, oral perception and visual perception is altered. You feel kind of protected and exposed at once. And it was something that, honestly, I only understood the moment I stood in this, um, in this object, which, which made me happy. And then this is the most, this was the thing I was the most unhappy with. So um, I was like, we need like styrofoam, and everybody was like, oh my god, it's a nightmare. People are gonna drag it everywhere. And I was like, I don't care. Let's build a space and fill it up with styrofoam. And then it was kind of weird to build a closed space with styrofoam, and, and it went on and on. So in the end, this is styrofoam actually. It's just giant, and um, I really didn't like it. However, it was the big hit of the show. So everybody <laughs> stayed in this pool forever. I had interviews in there. I had <laughs> student groups hanging out for an hour. It was a very hot summer. And it, it was oddly relaxing, really, this, uh, this, this pool. And by the time you had already taken your shoes off, and I noticed that visitors would come out of the pool and then just walk through the rest of the exhibition barefoot, which was interesting, because you actually did have a sort of experience where your usual behavior in the museum got interrupted just by taking the shoes off, by lying down, and um, this to me was an interesting experience. You walked out of the environment and um, happened upon a uh, vitrine with documentation of the environment, of the original environment. And maybe let me quickly, although I hate doing this, um, one thing that I thought was important, so you have these um, big steel crosses there, and this was um, our way. I worked with an architect from Brazil who was a friend, and um, we wanted to have a way to imitate Lublin's, um, you know, these works from the 60s. They seem entirely autonomous and open and free, but the artists decide things. They want you to go in a certain order through the work, for instance. Lublin wanted that. So this was our way of kind of showing you once you went into the environment, you could get out, but it was obvious visually you shouldn't. And also the 40 meters on the opposite wall, I didn't hang any artwork, it was all empty. So there was no visual stimulus um, as an alternative. Um, this I'm gonna do, this is much easier. It's almost too easy. Um, so as I said, the, the works were in terrible condition. This is in the parking garage. And unfortunately, even works that were in public collections, this was a work that was um, owned by the Pompidou. And it was one of her last objects and it was broken, and it summed up a whole decade of extremely complex <coughs> thought that had to do with Lacanian psychoanalysis and Duchamp's concept of the ready-made and of his alter ego, Rose uh, through the lens of feminism, and the work was broken. And there, very easily, and um, I just decided not, of course, to reconstruct this complicated glass object, but to simply have, and I apologize for the bad image, um, a little projection in the size of the work. Also, since the artist had different instances, both technically speaking and conceptually speaking, uh, of working with um, procedures of 
projection, also in the psychoanalytical sense. And um, that was it. Yeah, could you just uh, quickly remind like who was in your team? Because you, you mentioned this architect. Yeah. And, because it's important since the architect is not a... So it was only the architect, basically. I mean, um, the architect Marina Correa from, uh, from Sao Paulo, she had worked on a project at the Pinacothek in, um, in Munich uh, about Lina Bobadi, the architect. And we met and I showed her the work and the space and she immediately understood. And so one of the main problems of this installation, which the obvious thing I didn't mention, was that you have an, a straight space. Uh, you can't even the sculptural forms, such as the tunnel, they wouldn't uh, in Lublin shape wouldn't have fit. And we were also that environment was only one work among a retrospective. In Lublin's case, it was the only work that she showed there. So uh, Marina was absolutely like a crucial to um, think through together about how to lay it out in space and uh, where in the exhibition it would take place. Or could, could the environment be the circuit of the show? And you go, there were all sorts of different thoughts. And so it was between Marina and I and the rest of the, um, the, 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 exhibition, the exhibition objects that we kind of had to figure out the position and procedure of that, um, of that installation.